Hi, thanks for tuning in to uh, our course today. Uh, this series is offered in conjunction with the 2021 TDA meeting, our course today. What you always wanted to know about OSHA, but were afraid to ask. Our speaker is Mr. Lee Slayton. He's the Vice President of Healthcare with Smart Training. Uh, in this course, he will identify the five critical pieces of a successful OSHA compliance program. We'll define the chances of a dental practice being subjected to an OSHA inspection. We'll review the most common OSHA dental practice violations and the resulting fines. Lastly, preparing your practice for an OSHA inspection. Thanks for being with us today, Lee. Hey, thanks, Josh. Glad to be with you. Um, and sorry we're having to do this under the circumstances we are this year, but it beats nothing. Hey, so um, uh, just one question that comes up fairly frequently because I've, I've done this talk all over the country now several times and uh, it'll be evident at the end, but just to kind of let you know where I'm coming from when, when we're talking about these different issues today, I, I have folks stop me in the hallways and I always say, well, where, where do you get, where do you get all this information? Where we get it is this, you know, we've been, we've been helping practices um, be compliant for over a decade now. And during that time, we've done over 1,500 inspections of dental practices. So that's where this is coming from. Uh, what we see out there in the field in dental practices every single day. So this is not a theoretical practice um, for us. It's we're getting down in the weeds and, and helping folks be compliant. So that's where this is, that's the place this is coming from. So let's, let's talk about you know the things we're gonna the things we're gonna touch on today. What are the required building blocks for an effective safety program, and what does the enforcement lane, landscape look like if you ignore your obligations? Um, so the actually the six big the the big things that um, come together to form a good um, safety program, a compliance program, um, are your job hazard assessment, written safety programs, proper PPE, and we're gonna talk about that a lot today because we're still in the middle of the COVID pandemic and PPE has just become paramount. Um, your SDS book and the hazardous chemical inventory that goes with that, uh, training, and then atmospheric, atmospheric testing if you use nitrous. So those are the things we're gonna to touch on. So let's look first at the job hazard assessment. A lot of folks have never even heard of this before, um, but it's simply um, the process that she used to create the roadmap for your office's safety program. So it, it helps identify the hazards that your staff encounters as they go through their work day. Um, and the way we address that is by going through an interview process with one person from each job description. So we would we would talk to, in a, in a typical practice, we're gonna to talk to a dentist, we're gonna to talk to a, an RDA, an RDH, and someone who's non-clinical, like if they work administrative functions up at the front desk. And so what we're gonna do is, we're gonna, it's a, it's a very short interview, it takes five minutes or less. We're gonna to talk to them about Tell us what goes on in your typical work day. Um, uh, tell us the tasks you perform. And we, we, we actually have a list that we use. The tasks they perform, the instruments they use, um, so that we can define those hazards um, that they are exposed to each day. Now, you've got three ways to address those hazards. Um, um, First of all, if you can change the way a task is performed, typically that's not gonna be the case, but in some cases it is. I'll give you a good example. Um, if if a, um, an assistant is unsheathing the hypodermic for, for, the, um, for the dentist, that's a practice that, um, that's a task that could be changed to eliminate probably 50% of a chance of getting a dirty stick just by changing the way you're doing that task. So if you went from having the 
assistant unsheath that hypodermic to where only the doctor caps and uncaps those hypodermics. You've, you've cut um, the dental assistance exposure to that hazard by basically 100% uh, because they're not having to, to, to um, uh, uncap and recap needles. Um, so, and I don't know the last time you had to deal with a dirty stick was, but we have to deal with them more often than we'd like. Um, from a practice owner's perspective, um, that's going to cost at least a grand to deal with between blood draws and examinations by a doctor. Hopefully it doesn't have to go any, any further beyond that. So, so the first, again, the, that front line of, of how we address them is number one, can we change the way we're doing the task uh, or perhaps eliminate that task entirely? If you can't do that, then the next option is to um, address that through um, training um, and PPE. PPE is last, training is next. If you can train someone a better way to do a task, a safer way to do a task, that's easier. And then if you can't, you know, mitigate that risk by either changing the way somebody does something or training, uh, then you mitigate it with PPE. So for instance, what, what um, so let's say you're breaking down trays and sterilization. Uh, if you're wearing exam gloves, those are thin, um, probably, I'd say in the last five years, over over half of the dirty sticks that we had to deal with in dental practices have come in sterilization. Um, and of the sharps incidents that we had to deal with in sterilization, well over half would have been a non-issue. They wouldn't, in other words, in our view, they would not have happened had the person uh, dealing with those instruments actually been using utility gloves instead of exam gloves. So there's an example of PPE um, mitigating that risk. So as you go through these hazards, um, you're going to look at the tasks they perform and the instruments they use. That's what identifies the hazards. And that's why the job hazard assessment is so important because it helps create the roadmap for your safety program. So next, next, Next item up is written safety programs. A lot of people refer to that as your OSHA binder or your OSHA book. Um, now, um, because we're in the pandemic, most dental practices now are now required to have four written safety programs, always before it's been three. So what are those four programs? It's your exposure control plan, your hazard communication program, and your emergency action plan. Those have been the three that we've been dealing with since time immemorial in dentistry. Now we've got a fourth. It's called the Respiratory Protection Program. And we're going to talk about that more in just a moment. So let's talk about, in general, written safety programs. So they have to be updated periodically. Um, and we strongly recommend that they be updated at least annually but they should be updated periodically to reflect what's going on in the office. So let me give you a, an example. Um, in one of, the, one of those written safety programs yours is your emergency action plan. Well, there are gonna be a lot of your staff that are gonna be listed that have different responsibilities in that plan. So if Judy, for instance, is in charge of doing your head count at your, um, at your rally point, when you do an evacuation out of the office, if Judy suddenly is no longer in, no longer a part of your team, she's gone on, she's moved away, or for whatever reason, and someone else has been assigned that task, then that's got to be reflected in that emergency action plan. So that's why it's so important that your programs are updated periodically. Um, they must also be easily accessible. Um, I've walked into offices before where the um, where the written safety programs, the binder was in the office manager's office in a locked bookcase. Um, and if the office administrator is not always there, that administrator's office is locked. Well, those programs are worthless if they're locked away. So 
They've got to be easily accessible, cannot be under lock and key. This is a good time to talk about, can I store them electronically? We get that question quite often. And the answer is, it depends. <laughs> so here's what OSHA says. OSHA says that they must be easily accessible. Well, that term, that phrase is basically giving you enough rope to hang yourself. Because here's the deal. Um, let's say you've got your, um, your program stored electronically. Uh, and you've got them, you've got them on your um, cloud-based server. So we're firm believers at Smart Training that Murphy is alive and well. And um, when do you need to have access to these written safety programs? In an emergency, right? So what happens when that day comes and you have an emergency and for some reason your internet's down? Now they're not easily accessible, are they? So the practice we follow, and we're kind of belt and suspenders kind of folks, but the practice we follow is that if you want to have an electronic version, which is totally acceptable to OSHA, if you want to elect an electronic version, um, we also recommend that you go ahead and have a physical binder on location as well as a backup. Um, all of the things, practically all the things we're going to talk about today, if they come to pass, if you have an emergency in your office, uh, an urgent situation, that, that's where these written, written safety programs come into play. And those situations happened. They happen at the most inopportune times. So, um, and the biggest problem is that when it's an emergency, we rarely get a mulligan or a second chance or a do-over. However you want to phrase that, we rarely get an opportunity to rehearse it and make it right. So what we've got to do is we've got to be prepared on the front end. So you've got to have those programs easily accessible. So let's talk about the exposure control plan for starters. Um, in a word, it's PPE, personal protective equipment. Uh, it's the most understood um, portion of employee protection. Um, there are so many uh, misconceptions. There's so much misinformation about PPE out there. It isn't even funny. Uh, and it's gotten even more so during the pandemic. Uh, let's talk about what all is included in the exposure control plan. So PPE is number one. Uh, your exposure determination is number two. Now, what's an exposure determination? Well, number one, it's a process that you are required to do annually. So what you're doing is you're determining what uh, employees in your practice are exposed to bloodborne pathogens. Um, or from other potentially infectious material. Uh, you go through that process. It's not long. It takes you maybe five minutes to do. Um, basically, it's going to be anyone who has a clinical job description, um, a dentist, a hygienist, an assistant. Um, now, where it gets tricky is with what we call floaters. Let's say you've got someone that works at the front desk. Their job is administrative in nature 98% of the time. But let's say that the person that is working at the front desk, even though they're administrative, let's say they still um, um, keep their RDA, uh, their license active. Or let's say they're a hygienist that just doesn't perform hygiene anymore because they've gotten tired of it and they're working up front. If that person still does clinical um, procedures. In other words, let's say they break down trays, or let's say they take x-rays, or let's say they prep an operatory. Let's say they only do it once a year. They've still got exposure. 
So those are the things that you're uncovering in your exposure determination is who actually has exposure. And then you've got to address that by um, training and PPE and all these other things. But that ex exposure determination is a process. It takes five minutes. But I will promise you, based on what I've seen in the last decade, if OSHA comes in to do, uh, to, does an investigation in your office, if you do not have an up-to-date exposure determination, because you're supposed to do those annually, you're looking at a fine between three and five thousand dollars just for that one item. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Okay, what's up next? Engineering controls. And okay, what? What are engineering controls? We're not an engineering firm, we're a dental practice. Engineering controls are the things that are the processes that you have in place to try and eliminate as many hazards as you can. So let me give you a, a few, few examples of engineering controls. Um, a recapping device. Um, there are all sorts of different recapping devices where you can place the unsheathed needle in so that when a doctor comes into the, to the operatory to uncap that uh, needle, it's, it's very easy. It's a one-handed procedure um, uh, and recapping it is very, very easy. Now, we, we always have the what's called the one scoop, one handed scoop method um, to fall back on where the, the needle is lay, just laying on its side. And when you recap it, um, you're only using one hand. That way you don't ac accidentally do what Tim Conway did in that hilarious YouTube video. I'm sure you've seen from laughing where he stabs himself when he's uh, administering anesthetic. So. Those are engineering controls, and you need to review those each year um, along with your exposure determination. Another engineering control, which we rarely see in dentistry, is um, uh, self-recapping needles. Um, they're used in the medical world a lot, um, but in dentistry, they're not really that practical. Um, so... Anyway, so much for engineering controls. Let's talk about record keeping. Um, that's an important aspect. Um, keeping up with a sharps injury log. Now, I will tell you, um, a sharps injury log, oddly enough, is not required by OSHA in dental practices. Why, I do not know. But from a best practices standpoint, maintaining a sharps injury law is incredibly valuable because it allows you to look back over time and take a systematic look at, hopefully you don't have many, but your sharps is incidents, your dirty sticks, and take a, a deep dive with your staff on how did this happen and how can we prevent it from happening again? Um, that's, that's what it's all about. Um, you know, most dirty sticks don't result in anything more than a, a scare and some expense. Um, but, you know, I've got, I've got an old friend of mine whose wife contracted hepatitis in medical school from a dirty stick, and it's followed her her whole career. Um, there have been times where she's been unable to practice for over six months at a time. So um, it, it is a big deal. Um, so let's, um, if you keep track of them, and if you if you do an after action report, which is basically what a sharps injury log is, review that with your team so that you can go, okay, this is what happened before that caused this problem. How do we keep that from happening again? Okay. Um, housekeeping. Um, how do you how do you prep an operatory? How do you prep your uh, sterilization area? Not prep it, but keep it um, keep it clean, keep it sterilized, keep it safe to work in. Um, your needle stick and post exposure protocols are also part of the exposure control plan. 
they kind of go hand in hand with your sharps and your long. So, um, you know, what do you do when someone on your team um, has a needle stick? How do you handle that situation? You should have those protocols in place um, because just like any other emergency, um, the last thing you want to be doing is running around like a chicken when your head cut off. Um, and the best way to help prevent that is train and then have a protocol in writing so that you go to it and go through the protocol step by step in addressing the problem. Okay, labeling, we're not going to talk much about that right now because we're going to talk about it a whole lot more in, in the hazard communication program. And then training. Training is required, bloodborne pathogens and sharps training. Now, what a lot of folks don't realize, there are more practices than I care to count that think all that's required training wise each year is bloodborne pathogens training. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, you train based on what your job hazard assessment identifies as risks and hazards. You train for those. So I would submit to you that we have more risks and more hazards in a dental practice than from just bloodborne pathogens. So we'll, we'll get to that more a little farther down the line. So let's talk about your hazard communication plan, uh, or as it's referred to by us, your right to know. So what does that include? It includes your SDS book, your hazardous chemical inventory list. It includes secondary labeling. It includes training. Let's talk about all three of these. So your SDS book, in probably 75% of the offices that we go into the first time, We'll, we'll come up on an SDS book, or maybe that it hasn't been updated in a while, and they still have their SDS, uh, their MSDS sheets there. And I've been in offices where there have been two six-inch binders full of SDS sheets. Um, and there's no reason for that. Um, so let's talk just about, uh, let's talk a minute about what needs to go in your SDS book. Um, those SDS books that I just talked about where there were two six-inch binders, um, we opened those binders up, and there was an SDS sheet for practically every single item uh, material that they've used in the last 20 years. Um, so we're going to back up just a second, and, and let me ask you a question. Why do you have an SDS book other than it's required? The reason you have an SDS book is so that if there's an accident, there's a place you can go and look up the material that was involved in the accident, if there was a material involved. So let's say, for instance, uh, you get cavicide splashed up in your eyes. Um, you should have an SDS sheet for cavicide. And what does that SDS sheet have on it? Well, among other things, it's going to tell you how to treat that. So it's going to tell you what to do if you you got the cavicide in your eyes, or what if you got cavicide in your mouth, or what if you got cavicide on your skin. It has directions on how to deal with those hazards. So that's why you have an SDS book. Um, so it's critically important because 99% of the time when somebody goes to an SDS book, they're going because someone's been exposed to a material, to a chemical in that office, and they need to know how to treat that person. So most of the time when you're going to it, it's because there's an emergency. So again, because it's an emergency, we want to make sure that we've got everything there, right? And we want to make sure that we can access that information in a timely manner. Well, if it's an emergency, what's a timely manner mean? It means I need to grab that book and I need to be able to flip to that sheet in a hurry so I can figure out what to tell that person to do. So, um, so if you hear nothing else in this today about the HASCOM 
program, the hazard communications plan, know this. You don't want to have SDS sheets for every single item in your office in that SDS book. Let me say that again. You don't want to have SDS sheets for every single product in your office in that SDS book. Why is that? Your SDS book should only have SDS sheets for products that are deemed hazardous. Again, you only want SDS sheets for products that are deemed hazardous. That one statement I've taken, and I've taken, and, and I'm going to reference back to the practice where they had two six-inch binders full of SDS sheets. I went into that office and sat down with the OSHA lead in that office, and when we were through with the process of going through those two six-inch binders, we had the SDS sheets down to where they would fit in one two-inch binder. Think about that. We got it from two six-inch binders down to one two-inch binder. Now, my question to you is, if you had an accident and you needed to look up the information on a product, would you rather have to fumble through two six-inch binders or through one two-inch binder? Yeah, it's, pretty, it's a pretty easy answer, isn't it? And take it in a step further, if you were having to manage an SDX book, let's say it's your responsibility in your office to keep your SDS book up to date, which book would you rather manage? Would you rather manage a book that's only two inches thick or would you have to manage something that's two six inch binders? Yeah, that's an easy answer too, isn't it? So the only thing that goes in your SDS book are SDS sheets for products that you currently use that are considered hazardous. So if you've got products that you no longer use, you can put those in a separate binder called retired SDS. And you can put those in a, in a storage closet. You can put them wherever you want. They should be kept on the premises, but they don't have to be kept where you have to have immediate access to them. Your SDS book for current products that are considered hazardous, you keep in that SDS book. You've got to keep them organized. We recommend that you alphabetize them and you put an alphabetical index, A to Z index in that book. So they're alphabetized by name, either by manufacturer or by name of product. Typically, you, you organize them by the uh, name of the product um, so that they're easy to find. Again, we're making it easy to find in an emergency. Now, Okay, we've got our SDS book down to a manageable size. Let's talk about that hazardous chemical inventory list and why it's important. I've seen an office find about $4,000 simply because they didn't have a hazardous chemical inventory list. So let's ask ourselves, why is that so flipping important? It's a really simple answer. If you have an emergency in your office, and emergency personnel are called in. A fire truck's going to roll up. The incident commander, which is normally the fire captain, is going to come up to whoever that person, uh, you know, be it a, a male or female fire captain, they're going to come up to whoever they look they look at and think this person's in charge. And they're going to say, they're going to want to know two things. They're going to want to know, where is your electrical panel? because we know electricity and water don't play well together if it's a fire. But number two, that incident commander is going to want to know, what do you have in your practice that can hurt my people? That's why you have a hazardous chemical inventory list, so you can show them. Now, here's, the nice, here's one of the nice benefits about having an SDS book that only has hazardous uh, materials in it. It's this, your hazardous chemical inventory list can also be your table of contents for your SDS book, right? Because you only have 
products in that SDS book that are hazardous. So the way we recommend doing this is once you get that book down to where it's only got sheets for hazardous um, products in it, and you once you've got them in alphabetical order, then create your hazardous chemical inventory from that and do it in a spreadsheet program so that you've got it electronically and on paper. And each year as you update this book, because I'm here to tell you, now that you've got it in shape, you shouldn't spend more than five minutes a year updating it because you're not going to have that many new products that are coming in each year. So you can, you can do them immediately when you get a new product in, or you can wait and do it once a year. Um, but it makes it really, really easy to update that book and update that inventory list. Okay. I actually wrote an article for the TDA a couple of years ago on how to do this. Uh, and my email address will be at the end. If you'd like, email me and I'll be happy to send that. It's about a two page article. It's very simple, very, you know, it's just laid out step by step what we just talked about. So happy to share that with you. Okay, next item, secondary labeling. Um, it's basically this. Uh, if you've got products, let's say they're liquid or, or they can be dry. Um, if you take them out of the original container and you don't use them immediately, whatever um, container you put them in must be labeled. So let me say that again. If you take something out of its original container, because again, there's going to be a label on that container, right? And, and if it, and if there are hazardous properties, it's going to list them on that label. If you take that product out of that original container and you're not using it immediately, then you've got to label that container you're putting it into so that anyone who comes along and picks that container up, they will know what's in that container and if it can hurt them or not, and how it can hurt them. That is critical. That's another thing that OSHA really looks for when they walk into an office, and they are not shy about finding people for not having those secondary labels, okay? Then the last thing as far as HASCOM is training. Um, so training about the GHS system, the globally harmonized system, which is which was implemented when SDS sheets came into being, uh, when they replaced MSDS sheets. Um, so again, training is a piece of the hazard communication program. Okay, let's talk about the emergency action plan. Um, there are several things that are involved in this. Um, an evacuation map. Um, you should have at least, depending on the size of your office, you should have at least one evacuation map in your office uh, in a common area. So maybe a hall, a common hallway. Um, um, so let's talk about what, what that evacuation map should look like. Well, number one, it doesn't have to look like Ansel Adams did it. Um, it can be a sketch. It doesn't have to be perfectly to scale, but someone should be able to look at it and tell where they are and how to get the heck out of Dodge if uh, things go awry. Um, so it should it should list any exits on it. Uh, and of course, uh, depending on your local fire code, um, sometimes they go based on square footage. Sometimes they go based on other things. You're going to have at least one exit. Um, other many offices have two or more. Um, you want to make sure all of those exits are well marked um, and that they are um, the methods of egress, the getting out. You don't have to move five boxes out of the way to get out of an emergency exit door. Um, it should not have a keyed deadbolt on the inside where it's keyed on the inside. Uh, if it does, uh, you better make darn sure that that deadbolt is unlocked whenever the office is open. Um, but my advice is don't have a deadbolt on any exit door that is keyed from the inside so that it could somehow be locked if there's a need to use it in an emergency. 
Um, so on that evacuation map, you should have the exit smart. I would have where your fire extinguisher or extinguisher are located. I would have where your AED uh, and your first aid kit are located. And I would also have where your, um, uh, your SDS book and your written safety programs are located so that your staff knows where to go to um, in the event of needing one of those items for an emergency. Um, I'm going to digress for just a moment. Uh, I said so that your staff knows where to go. Um, here's something you need to understand about the difference between OSHA and the Texas State Board of Dental Examiners. This is going to sound crass, but it's the truth. OSHA doesn't care if you maim or kill all your patients. They don't care. That's not their bailiwick. What they care about is that every employee goes home, and that includes the dentist in most practice, practices, that every employee goes home safe, happy, and healthy at the end of the workday. Um, OSHA's concern is that the practice owner provides a safe workplace uh, devoid of um, um, hazards um, that can hurt. So that's what they're looking for. Now, the TSBDE, on the, other, on the other hand, they really don't care so much about this. What they care about is your patients, that they're getting good outcomes and that they're kept safe. So just remember, there's, there's a big... There's a big, pretty vivid dividing line there um, between the two. So, okay. Um, so that's it for evacuation maps. So let's talk about fire drills. Um, I would say well over half of the offices we go into for the first time haven't done a fire drill in probably five years or more, if ever. So you should be doing a fire evac drill at least two times a year. And I don't mean just talking about it. I mean, actually walking through the steps. Um, who does what? Who's in charge of what? And where to go? Um, because practice makes perfect. Again, as, as I talked about before, you know, when there's an emergency, it's rare when we get a do-over. It's rare when we get a mulligan. Um, Having everyone get out okay, intact, uninjured, um, it is it is critical that you practice. You know, my, my college football coach told me, Lee, you play like you practice. Um, it, it's, you know, you've got to build some muscle memory about what you're going to do. Um, hopefully, you'll never, ever have to deal with this. But with people I've talked to who have, um, you know, not panicking and knowing what to do can make all the difference. Now, we're talking about who does what and where to go. So um, as part of that emergency action plan, you're going to, it's going to have listed, hey, here's where we go if we have to bug out. Uh, and everyone should know that. Uh, and everyone should um uh, know that no matter which exit out of the out of the office you go out of, you may be going out the front door, you may be going out the back door, but you're all going to end up at that same assembly point. Um, and so you want to be really specific. You know, okay, my my assembly point is the dumpster at the northwest corner of the parking lot. Um, and who's going to be in charge of doing the hit count? Well, that's going to be Judy. And if Judy's not there, who's going to be the backup person? That's going to be Dr. Letson. Uh, and why is all this important, Lee? That's what you're asking right now. Why is it so important? Well, number one, it's important that everyone knows who they're responsible for. Because as a, as a clinician, maybe you're responsible for the person in your chair in addition to yourself. Or maybe anyone else in that operatory. Um, if you go out the back door or the front door, why is it important we all end up over at the same assembly point just as long as we get out safely? Well, let me tell you in one short answer. Um, when that emergency vehicles roll up, that 
incident commander is going to, again, track down the person that looks like they're in charge. So if there's a um, group of people standing next to that dumpster at the assembly point, that incident commander is going to walk over and ask who's in charge. And if Judy raises her hand, then the next question is make a break. That incident commander is going to say, is everyone out of your office? And if Judy, if Judy can't tell that incident commander that everyone's out, guess what happens next? That's right. Responders have to go into what may be a burning building to check and do a sweep because they don't know that everyone's out and has gotten out successfully. So these things are, these things are critical and you need to do them at least twice a year so that folks remember what their, um, what their obligations are. Okay. Last part of the written programs is the respiratory protection program. Um, this has all come about because of COVID because now um, based on three different regulatory authorities, um, anyone that's within six feet of a potentially aerosol generating procedure should be wearing a respirator, not a surgical mask. So because of that, um, OSHA has what's called a respiratory protection program. It's been in place since the 1980s. Uh, at Smart Training, we've been dealing with a respiratory protection program for the last 25 years in industrial clients. Well, now dental practices are having to deal with them because any, any, any business entity that has staff that are wearing respirators must have a respiratory protection program. And it's simple why you have to have it. Not everyone can wear a respirator safely. Let me say that again. Not everyone can wear a respirator safely. Folks that have COPD, folks that are asthmatic, there are a host of different reasons why someone cannot wear a respirator safely. So we've got a conundrum there because in dentistry right now, um, if you're within six feet of an aerosol generator procedure, uh, the CDC says you should have one. OSHA says you should have one. And right now, even the TSBDE requires it uh, as law in Texas that you've got to have on a respirator. So let's talk about what's what's involved in a respiratory protection program because there, there are a lot of misconceptions. First of all, you have to have an administrator of the program and you have to have an actual written program document um, that everyone has access to. Anyone who's wearing a respirator also has to have training. Now, it's, this is not three hours of, you know, boilerplate. It's, it's actually pretty short. Uh, short. Um, you know, typically training lasts 20 minutes or less. Um, for anyone wearing a respirator, whether they're wearing it voluntarily, because you, you can wear one voluntarily if you're not within six feet of an aerosol generating procedure, um, if you're required to wear one, in other words, if you're within six feet of an aerosol generating procedure, you're required to wear one. So, but anyone, whether they're wearing one voluntarily or, or um, um, required, they have to have a medical evaluation. It's a pretty simple process. There's a medical questionnaire that's filled out. Um, the dental practice owner, the, the dentist, um, as a licensed healthcare professional, it's within their scope to review those medical uh, uh, questionnaires to see if someone's medically uh, fit to wear a respirator. And then there's fit testing. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation about fit testing out there right now. Anyone who wears a respirator who's required to wear a respirator, so that's anyone within six feet of an aerosol generating procedure, has to be fit tested, has to have an initial fit test. Um, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. And there have been five different dental practices that have been fined, um, one severely uh, for not having a respiratory protection program and doing fit testing. Uh, one single location practice was fined over $24,000 for not having an RPP in place and for not doing fit testing. This is the real deal, folks. This is critical. So now, 
The biggest piece of misinformation about fit testing is that some people have heard that OSHA has suspended the requirement for fit testing. That is incorrect. What they have suspended is annual fit testing. So there are two types of fit testing. One is the initial fit testing that you should have when you first start wearing a respirator. And then there is an annual fit test required every year thereafter. Well, during the pandemic, OSHA has suspended that annual fit testing. That's the only thing about the RPP that OSHA has backed off on during the pandemic. That may change, but right now, that's the only thing that has changed. So those are your four written programs. Let's talk about training. Um, and there are some misconceptions here as well. Um, every employee should complete their initial safety training on or before their first day on the job. No ifs, ands, or buts. There was a, there was a dental practice north of Fort Worth uh, last year that was fined over $6,000, not because they hadn't done training, but because some of their employees had not received their safety training before they started to work. Now, if you think about this for a second, it'll make sense. The greatest number of employee injuries happen in the first 60 days on the job. That's why OSHA makes this a big deal. Um, okay, so your initial training has got to be on or before your first day on your job and then annually thereafter, addressing all the identified hazards, not just bloodborne pathogens, okay? Your training should be consistent and uniform in content. That's more, that's as much from a legal defense standpoint for a practice owner as anything, you want to be able to show if there's an incident, the type of training you provided, uh, and did you provide it to everyone? So that's one of the advantages of online training. It's very consistent. It's uniform in content. All your staff receives the exact same training. Um, the third thing is there should be at least three years worth of documentation. If OSHA comes in and investigates and training is an issue, they're going to want to see at least three years worth of documentation for the training that was taken by all of the employees. The last item for training is taking a test to prove comprehension. Um, again, this is a, as much as anything, this is a liability issue. Um, if, if there's an injury on the job, uh, and in researching that in, injury, OSHA determines that the training should have helped uh, mitigate that hazard that caused the accident. Uh, they're going to want to see, has, have folks taken the training and did they comprehend it? So the best way to prove comprehension is to take a quiz. And of course, you're going to need to have a record of that. Last is the air sampling program. If your practice is using nitrous more than once or twice a month, uh, you should be testing. Um, you should be doing air sampling uh, two times a year or depending on what your testing results have been in the past, you could go down to once a year. But test at least once a year for excess levels of nitrous. Um, you should be checking your hoses and fittings at least once a year. That's really simple to do. There are probably 20 different videos out on YouTube on how to, how to do a soap bubble, S-O-A-P, bubble test on all your hoses and fittings. It's really easy to do. Um, probably the most important things though are educating your patients. Um, that's proper Improper use of the in nitrous is the biggest reason you get um, excess levels of waste gas in your operatories. Um, so you want to educate your patient on the proper breathing. 
uh, inhale and exhale through the nose, uh, and they need to minimize talking. Uh, if you do those three things, inhale and exhale, minimize talking, make sure that mask is a proper fit, that's going to eliminate 99% of your problems. Okay. Question time. I'm, I'm sorry we don't have that this year, but I'm going to leave this up for just a second so you can see my phone number and my email address. If you'll email me any questions you have, I'll be happy to respond. Uh, if you want a copy of that um, how to um, how to um, get your SDS book in good shape, shoot me an email and I'll send you that article. So let's go on real quick. Let's see, how am I doing on time? Okay, 50 minutes. All right, so let's talk about the enforcement landscape. So we kind of saved the best for last because I get these questions all the time. So what are the odds I'll be on the receiving end of an OSHA investigation? What are the causes of most OSHA investigations? What are the penalties involved? Um, and what's the biggest takeaway from doing what we do? Um, I've had the unfortunate, the dubious honor of spending a lot of time in the last decade defending dental practices and OSHA investigations. Um, I've seen things that will curl your hair. So I want to share with you the biggest takeaway from that as well. Um, you know, um, so what are the odds I'll be on the receiving end of an OSHA investigation? Actually, they're pretty low with one wild card thrown in there just to keep you on your toes. The, if, if you look back over the data, and I look at OSHA investigation data every week on their website, the odds are about the same as the odds of you getting an, um, an IRS audit. They're pretty flipping low. But let's move on to the second piece of that. What are the causes of most OSHA investigations? Here is the wild card in this. The wild card is anonymous complaints. Now, where can an anonymous complaint come from? It can come from um, a disgruntled employee. Maybe somebody got passed over for a raise. It can come from disgruntled ex-employees. It can come from employees who have a valid safety concern, but for whatever reason, they're afraid to bring it up with the practice owner or with management. Maybe they're afraid of being labeled a troublemaker um, and they don't know where else to turn. Um, so uh, they can come from competitors down the street. Uh, they can come from ex-girlfriends or boyfriends. They can come from basically anywhere. And here's the upshot. If OSHA receives an anonymous complaint, by law, they have to investigate. Yep. Any anonymous complaint OSHA receives, by law, they have to investigate. And the problem with that is it may be a spurious complaint. It may not have any basis in fact. But OSHA has got to come check it out anyway. And it's not, I, in, in all of the defenses I've, I've conducted of dental practices in front of OSHA, um, I would say at least half of those were not, a, were not involving the original complaint. They were involving something else that was uncovered when OSHA started investigating. So it's like the proverbial camel's nose under the tent. Once OSHA comes in, anything they see with their eyes, um, anything is fair game. So, um, so, you know, bottom line is you want to keep that from happening. So let's talk about worst case. What, what are the penalties if, if you're cited? Um, so in the last five years, uh, inspections of dental practices have typically resulted in an average of four violations. Okay. Um, now, two years ago, there was legislation that was set up that OSHA's fines were going to go up or down each year based on the rate of inflation because they didn't want to get the Congress didn't want to get in a position where one year 
maximum fines could be $10,000 in the next year because they hadn't raised them in 10 years, they could jump to $20,000. So they're just, it's tagged to the rate of inflation. Right now in 2021, uh, the maximum penalty for a first time serious violation is a little over $13,000, okay? Now, it's kind of like getting your first DWI. You don't want to get the first one because if you ever get a second one, it's Katie bar the door. Um, the first violation that you're cited for, uh, if it's 13 grand, it's a serious violation. There's some other repercussions other than just a fine. Uh, now you're going to be on OSHA's hit list for about the next five to seven years. You're going to be at, at probably about a 70% greater risk of having another um, inspection or an investigation. Now, what happens if you get cited a second time and it's for the same violation? So let's say you got a shark container overflowing and you don't have a hazardous chemical inventory list and OSHA comes in and hits you for 13 grand. If they come back a year later and that shark container is overflowing again, um, your hazardous chemical inventory list is not updated. They can now hit you for up to $136,000 and some change um, per violation. So it's it's a serious deal. It's a serious deal. So we just, we're, that's a great segue into what's the biggest takeaway from all the OSHA defense work I've done over the last decade. It's simply this. It is far easier and far less expensive for dental practices to do the right thing to begin with than to have to come back after the fact, scramble around to try and mitigate a situation once the investigators have come in. That's what it's all about. Josh, I don't know, can we can can folks see pictures or, is, or are they just hearing the audio? I'm guessing no, they, they, can, they can certainly see pictures um, if they're in your slideshow, for sure. Okay. We've got about three minutes left, and I'm going to run through just some typical violations we've seen out in the workplaces uh, over the last 10 years. Um, um, like I said, we've, you know, we're like the farmers with well, the guy in the farmer's insurance saying that we've seen it. We know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. So let's look at a co some, some common violations. So what do we have here? We've got a, a container of what looks like um, probably a pre-soak, uh, but what's the problem with that? Well, it's not for immediate use. It's, it's stored, right? So there should be a label telling us what's in that container. That's a biggie. OSHA will get you for that every single time. What's next? Well, this is, this is a little blurry, but that's an emergency exit, isn't it? And guess what? what? What's wrong with that? Well, number one, there's a chair in front of that door, so it wouldn't be easy to get out. And the other thing is they've got a bar lock across the back door. That does not qualify as an emergency exit as it's set up. And if you've listed it as an emergency exit on your EVAC plan map and uh, you've got a emergency exit sign on that, they are going to cite you for that big time. Let's hope the only bad thing to come out of that is that they cite you. Let's hope you don't ever have to have a, let's hope you don't ever have a fire and have to use that as an exit and that someone doesn't get out because of it. Well, let's look at PPE. Um, that hygienist doesn't have on a lab jacket, does she? Nope, sure doesn't. Scrubs do not, in probably 99% of all situations in dental practices, scrubs do not count as PPE because you don't remove them when you come out of a clinical setting. Fire extinguishers must be mounted. They can't just be sitting somewhere on a counter. They can't be sitting uh, in a cabinet. They've got to be mounted on the wall uh, so that folks can see them easily. This will not cut it. Here's another situation where lack of proper PPE, no lab jacket.
Here's an ultrasonic cleaner that doesn't have the cover on it. When that is running, now it doesn't look like it's running right now, but when that's running, the cover has to be on it. More incorrect PPE or lack of PPE. Now what's wrong here? Well, we're in a clinical area. This, this is probably in sterilization. And what do we have there? We have, looks like some Coca-Cola, some coffee, and maybe a cookie. Um, you cannot have consumables in clinical areas. They will dock the heck out of you for that. You cannot have consumables in clinical areas. Consumables should only be in the break room or in a private office, um, but they cannot be in clinical areas. Hmm, got another problem with secondary labeling here, don't we? Yes, there's no telling what's in that container. The person who put it in there knew, but how many other people are on your team? So they have to have a label on it if it's not for immediate use. Got some more problems with PPE here. Now, code says you have to have at least 26 inches of clear space around electrical panels. Why is that? Again, if it's an emergency, you need to be able to get to that panel in a hurry and shut everything down. Uh, you would be cited. Uh, the fire marshal would probably close your office until this problem was rectified, if the fire marshal walked in. Ooh, this is up close and personal. What is that? That's an eyewash station, isn't it? Looks like there's some junk down in there, doesn't it? How would you like to run in there having gotten, maybe you got cavicide in your eyes, and you run into the eyewash station, you turn it on, you have your eyeball, you have your eyelids pulled back so that water will shoot up into your eyes to flush out the chemicals, and yet you get this gunk up in your eyes instead. Wouldn't that be fun? So that green cap over there on the left, there's a reason for that cap. That the, the, Your eyewash station should always be capped so that they're kept clean. Well, we've got some more problems here with PPE or lack of. Ah, the old proverbial overflowing sharps container. Most sharps container have a, have a level, a mark on them. They shouldn't be more than three quarters full. Um, when they get to this level, OSHA will hound you. They will hit you hard if they see that. And, you know, it's unsafe. This is what an eyewash station should look like. There is one huge gas cylinder that is not chained to the wall, and they will cite you for that. They need to be chained to the wall so that they can't fall over and turn into an unguided missile if the um, valve should break off. Now, the smaller oxygen bottles down below, they're not, they're not a problem, but the big ones are. They've got to be, um, they've got to have some type of retaining strap or chain. Here's another secondary labeling problem. We don't know what's in that. We think we do, but we don't know for sure. Needs to have a label. Your refrigerators, if you have a refrigerator in your break area, it should not have any non-consumables. So bleach trays, um, uh, tissue samples, anything like that need to be stored uh, in a clinical area. Uh, most dental practices will have a small refrigerator for that purpose, like in a lab or in sterilization, it should be labeled non-consumables only. And your refrigerators in your break areas should be labeled consumables only. And there the twain shall meet. Here's another problem with a consumable in a clinical area. And right over there, that what looks like a candy jar, I have no idea what that liquid is, but it needs to be labeled. 
here's where we're mixing it up. You see all the uh, non-consumables at the bottom, and then you've got foodstuffs at the top. If OSHA sees this, they will cite you. Fire extinguishers have to be inspected every year. What some people do instead, though, is they will go out and buy a new fire extinguisher each year. Uh, if you do that, then your receipt for that fire extinguisher will serve as the inspection tag for the first year. That's why this, this, uh, this receipt is uh, taped on the fire extinguisher. That serves as your inspection tag for the first year. And there's an eyewash station with the cover off. Josh, I've enjoyed this. I hope folks have gotten something out of it. If you've got questions, please feel free to reach out to me via email. It's Lee Slayton at smarttraining.com. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Lee, thanks very much. And, uh, you know, I know it's a, a year this year where not everyone can go to TDA meeting. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy that we can present this information and we thank you for doing so. Everyone take care. Thank you, Josh. Always a pleasure.